take it you liked our sign. <laughs> These are uh, fluorescent light bulbs, and they are just tied onto a piece of wood here. If you've been here before, you know we open every show with that. Some students made that for us a while back. At home, those bulbs are put into fixtures. A strong electrical field is generated across them. The gas molecules get excited. When they drop back down into their lower energy state, they give off energy. It causes the bulbs to fluoresce. Here, the strong electric field is being produced by this Tesla coil. It's producing such a strong electric field, the air is breaking down and becoming a conductor. That's what happens in a lightning storm. So we made a little bit of lightning today also. We are, uh, I'd like to uh, start off by asking you a question to see if you've been to one of our shows before. So if this is your very first time to a physics show, give yourselves a round of applause. Welcome, welcome. And if you've been here before, give yourselves a round of applause. Excellent, welcome back. Um, physics, what is that all about? I need to tell you that before we can start our show, don't we? So, uh, you're in school, you study lots of great things, right? You could almost put them into different categories, the subjects that you study. You've got your reading and writing, and your history, and math, and one of those categories Science, right? Give it up for science, yes, that's good. And science can be broken up into lots of different categories, right? Your geology, chemistry, and biology, and one of those categories, physics, that's right. And physics is all about trying to explain the world we live in trying to explain how the world works. And so it can be broken up into lots of different topics, right? Last year, if you were with us, uh, we talked about sound and resonance. This year, we're talking about inertia, temperature and pressure, maybe uh, electricity next year. I like to say physics is a journey, and we're delighted uh, you're here to go along with us on that journey. The, uh, the community around Foothill College is so supportive of the college. We appreciate it very much. We're delighted we can put on a show like this for you today. Thank you for coming. Uh, today, uh, those are the topics. Let me introduce the other folks that are gonna be on stage here. Foothill physics instructor, David Morosco. And we love to show off our students. Marcella Porta is one of our students. And Derek Lau, who's actually transferred already, he's moved on. He's at San Jose State, but he agreed to come back and help us out. Thank you. And I'm Frank Coscarano. So you saw it on our opening graphic. You know what I like to say? If you can't have fun with physics, you aren't a very fun person. So let's have some fun. Let's get started. About a year ago, David comes into my office. He says, Frank, around the time of our February shows, it's going to be the 450th anniversary of Galileo's birthday. We should have some special Galileo tribute. And I said, wow, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> I said, that sounds great. So that's what we did. We put together a little special show. Um, in honor of some of the contributions that Galileo made to physics. He made many contributions to science, to physics. We're going to talk about a few of them today. He was a very clever guy. We're not even going to touch on any of the contributions he made to astronomy. There were many. So uh, we'll weave these throughout our show today. And we're going to start off with one of his biggest contributions to physics, the idea of inertia. And we were kind of stuck thinking about things the wrong way. And so not a lot of progress was made in physics. Galileo came along, because let, let's face it, if, if I have a box here and I push it across the stage, it's going to stop, isn't it? It's going to stop because it's interacting with the stage. There's friction acting on it, right? And so people thought that if something's moving, it wants to come to rest. That's its natural state. It's going to come to rest. And that's wrong. And so we couldn't build on that. 
And it's very interesting how Galileo supposedly got this idea. He had a ramp like this, and he released a marble, and he said, where is that marble going to stop? And he found out it comes to rest at the same height he released it from. And then he thought, well, what if I bend that ramp down so it's much longer on this side? Where is that marble going to come to stop? Turns out it goes way up, travels a much longer distance, but it stops at the same height it was released from. And then he bent it flat. And he said, where is that going to come to stop, come to rest? And it's going to keep going forever, he said. And that is correct. If something is moving, it is going to keep moving forever until some force acts on it and makes it stop, like friction from the floor. If something is in motion, it's going to stay in motion. If something is at rest, it's going to stay at rest until a force acts on it and changes it. And that is the idea of inertia. That was his idea, and then all kinds of progress was made after that. Who did this? So let's, uh, let's take a look at, maybe you've, uh, you've done this experiment yourself. I like to start off with a high-tech piece of scientific equipment. So we've got our, our wagon here, and the ball in the wagon. <coughs> okay? And uh, if we can switch the close-up camera, thank you. Then uh, if I give the wagon a push in this direction, what happens to the ball? Should we see? Here it goes. What happened to it? Maybe this will help. The ball is right here. Okay? I'm going to push the wagon forward. Are we ready? Here it goes. The ball actually did go forward a little bit because the wagon was pushing it that way. It didn't have a choice, right? But because it has inertia, because it resisted that change in motion, the wagon went much further than the ball did. The ball lagged behind the wagon. How do we know the ball has inertia? Because it's made of stuff. It has mass. It has weight. That's how we measure inertia, how much mass something has. So you and I also have inertia, but I probably have a little bit more than you do. So what happens? If the wagon's moving, so the ball's at the back of the wagon, the wagon's moving, and then it stops. Did you see that one more time? The ball has inertia, it's moving with the wagon. When the wagon stops, the ball keeps moving until it hits something that makes it stop. That happens to us when we're in the car, too. We don't want to keep moving and have the windshield be, be the thing that stops us, right, in our car, if the car stops suddenly. So what do we do? We wear a seatbelt, right? Okay, so when the car is moving and it stops suddenly, the ball is held in place. So please, wear your seatbelts. <laughs> So, the wagon, when it's empty, it has, it has some inertia, right? It's made of stuff, it has some weight, but it's empty. It doesn't have a lot of inertia. So if I apply a force to it, I can get its motion to change. And I'm going to uh, apply a force to it right now. And the motion of the wagon changes a lot because it doesn't have much inertia. But if I could magically increase the inertia of the wagon, add some kind of a massive object to the wagon, <laughs> now it has much more inertia. Safety first. <laughs> and I apply the same force to this more massive, more inertia object. Let's see what happens. Its motion doesn't change very much. The same force didn't have the same effect. Thank you. So let's see what happens with a hammer and an anvil. All right. 
this is a hammer. And the have a hammer has a lot of inertia. So when I get the hammer moving, it will want to continue moving. And if I have a nail that's in the board and doesn't have a lot of inertia, the hammer will drive the nail into the board. Now, I have my hand right here, and I have my hammer. If I hit my hand with the hammer, it's going to hurt. But because I have this big, massive anvil with a lot of inertia and a lot of mass, it will want to resist movement, and it will keep my hand safe. Let's see what happens. My hand is safe. So, we've been talking about inertia. I've got inertia. Anvils have inertia. Lots of stuff that we do with every day has inertia, like plates have inertia. Glasses have inertia. Even forks have inertia. Table claws also have inertia. So if you have inertia and you're not moving, are you going to want to move? No. I think Frank is going to try and make that tablecloth move, though. Yeah, he's going to yank it straight out. But because those other things have inertia, they're going to want to stay where they are. Frank, I think something's missing now. Forty-nine more candles because it's Galileo's 450th birthday, but we're going to skip that step. Okay, we're going to count this down. Three, two, one. Kids, should you try that at home? The correct answer to both of those questions is yes. <laughs> but we need to listen to Frank first. So I guarantee the first few times you try this, the object is going to end up on the floor. So it's best not to use the fine china. Start out, I like to use a block of wood like this. That works pretty well, a little block of wood. The other thing you can use is a book. And uh, if you're, I don't know if you can see that, but if your book is about Galileo, it works really well. <laughs> so, another thing that has inertia is an egg. But if I drop it, what's going to happen to the egg? It's going to land on the floor and crack. But suppose I was careful and I dropped it into a glass of water. Would that be okay? Yes. I think that, that would be okay for the egg. So Frank has been building something very special here. He's got a glass of water, and on top he put a pie plate and a cardboard tube, and now he's balanced the egg in there. Now he's taking his magic broomstick. He's going to use his broomstick to knock that pie plate and the tube out of the way. So they're going to come out in this direction. And that egg, since it's got inertia, that should fall straight down, because it does not want to fly. So let's count this one down again, OK? Three, two, one. You understand what I'm doing here, right? <laughs> I play that way. Let's see what happens to the egg, OK? Three, two, one. So let me show you a couple of tricks though. You can do like the graphic here. Put a little piece of cardboard over the, over the cup, put a coin on there, use your finger or get a pencil and flick the cardboard out of the way. That works really well. If you really want to use the pie plate, you know, you don't have to use an egg. You can uh, use a uh, bowling ball like this. 
Bowling ball? I just mean a golf ball. Yeah, bowling ball? That's nuts, Frank. That's crazy talk. Bowling ball would be impossible. Nobody ever use a bowling ball. Yeah, I don't know. Or would Wouldn't they? works. So we wanted to supersize the egg and the water and initially we were going to make a watertight container that would um, hold the bowling ball but that proved to be a problem because it's so heavy so it would probably break anything we made. So we made it with wood, plastic and foam and so that the foam is going to receive all the shock from the bowling ball. So. Here it is. You want to see how it works? Yes. Okay, so let's count. So three, two, one. Another fun experiment with inertia. Bowling ball. I have one of those. We'll hang it from a string. We'll have a string underneath. All we need is a handsome physics instructor and we can carry out this experiment. <laughs> Three out of four ain't bad, right? Here we go. So we've got a string, and a bowling ball, and another string. And I'm going to ask you, when I push down, on the lower string, like this, which one is going to break? Why don't you give me some applause if you think the upper string is going to break? Let's hear it if you think the lower string is going to break. Okay, are we ready? Here goes. Let's try that again. Let's try that again. Hold on. Oh, I've got two. That's my problem. I had two strings holding up the top and only one at the bottom, of course. There we go. One string at the top, one string at the bottom. It helps if you can count when you, before you do this. Okay, are we ready? Yeah. Okay. So what do you think? How about if we repeat that experiment? Would you like that? Yeah. Are you ready? Here goes. One, two, three. So I kind of played a trick on you there, didn't I? I said I was going to repeat the experiment. But when you repeat an experiment, you have to do it exactly the same way each time. And I didn't do that. The first time I pushed slowly, so the upper string was holding up both the weight of the bowling ball plus my force I was pushing with. The lower string was only holding up the force I was pushing with, so the upper one broke. The second time I pushed fast, so the lower string got stretched and broke, but the inertia of the bowling ball prevented it from moving very far. The upper string was protected by the inertia of the bowling ball. What else has inertia? Shopping carts have inertia. They're on a relatively low friction surface, the wheels. Let's see what happens to the shopping carts on this truck behind the Target store. There they are, they're just sitting there, kind of like the plate, sitting on the tablecloth. And now the truck is moving like the tablecloth. Basically in the same place, 
just a little lower to the ground. Shall we watch that one more time? talked about the fact that we need to wear seatbelts when we're in our cars because we have inertia. How can you use inertia to make your life better? I think about how do I get ketchup out of that bottle, right? I turn it upside down like this. There's a little bit of ketchup left in the bottom. And I turn it upside down. I get it moving real fast and then I stop it, right? And the ketchup inside keeps moving and ends up near the head, top of the bottle where I can get it out. You use inertia all the time. A few years ago we did a show with inertia as a theme. My son saw that show. A couple of weeks later, he's eating pancakes. You know how you use the side of your fork to cut a bite off your pancake, but sometimes you don't cut all the way through. It's still a little tiny bit connected there. So you stick that piece with your fork and you give it a quick tug and it breaks loose from the rest of the pancake. My son did that. And then he said to me, Dad, I used inertia to cut my pancake. <laughs> oh. As a physics instructor, there's no prouder moment. But we all know about this stuff. We all know about this because we've lived in this world. We know about it. We might not know the name for something, but we know about it. I want to do a little test with you. Do me a favor. Hold your hands out in front of you like this. And pretend that you have my wallet in one hand and my cell phone in your other hand. What can you do to tell me which one is heavier? You know what I see right now? I see a lot of people doing this. <laughs> you know why you're doing that? Because when you have two things in your hands that are about the same weight, you'll never be able to tell which one's heavier. But you know that the heavier one has more inertia. It's going to resist changes in motion. So if you shake them, you might be able to detect that much easier. You know about this stuff. The physics of inertia, it's all around us in our everyday lives. <laughs> Galileo made other contributions to physics. One of them was his uh, study of the pendulum. The story is that he was in church and he was looking at the chandeliers and some of them were just swinging a little bit. And some of them were swinging at a much bigger arc. And it appeared to him that it took the same amount of time for the pendulum that was just swinging a little bit to swing back and forth to complete one cycle. It took the same amount of time as the pendulum that had a big swing to it. And he thought, that is weird. That doesn't seem right. He studied the pendulum quite a bit. He later showed that that was indeed the case. So let's see, that's called the period. The time it takes for the pendulum to complete a cycle is called the period of the pendulum. And let's see what happens here. What things might affect the period of a pendulum? Well, let me first start out with two identical pendula. Same length, same mass. We're going to Move them the same amount, so they have the same arc. And I'll let go, and let's see if the, if the period is the same. I hope so, these are identical, right? I'm gonna let them go through three cycles because then it exaggerates any differences. Here it goes. One, two, three. Okay, it looked pretty much the same to me, right? So now, let's change something. I'll first, I'll change the angle. 
So this is what Galileo, this is what really surprised Galileo. Let's see what happens when I let go of these, okay? One of them is gonna do a big arc, like that. The other one is gonna do a small arc, like that. Okay, you ready? Here it goes. One, two, three. Okay, it appears that even the angle, that's what Galileo said, that is crazy. He studied the pendulum a lot after that. Let's change uh, the, the mass of one of these. Let's make one of these a big, heavy object. <laughs> this is kind of tricky because the center of each object has to be at exactly the same length. But I think we've got this dialed in. Are we ready? One, two, three. Even the mass didn't affect it at all. So something must change it. What changes it? Let's try a different length. So we've got another string here that's much shorter. And I'll let go of these and we'll see. You ready? Here it goes. One, two, three for the short one and three for the long one. So there, we had a big difference, didn't we? One finished much earlier than the other one. So the length of the string has a big effect on the period of the pendulum, the time it takes to complete one cycle. But all those other things, no effect. So let's see if we can take this and make a really cool demonstration for you. Marcella's gonna tell you about what we did. So, again, he wants to supersize the pendulum experiment. And so, he made this really big frequency. And what it does is that um, the smallest one, the shortest pendulum, has uh, this 35 cycles in 50 seconds, and it goes back and forth 35 times. And then the next one is 34, 33. The last one does 17 in 50 seconds. So what we do is we start them all at the same time, and then they each do their own thing. They go back and forth, back and forth. They do some shapes, and after 50 seconds, they come together in one line, and then they start all over again. So you pay attention to that green ball, because um, if you can see here, they're going only this way. So if you follow the green ball, you'll be able to see their the real movement. Um, Another one of Galileo's contributions, uh, before we put that away, we're going to, that was really a lovely demonstration, wasn't it? <laughs> it takes a little while though, so we're only going to do it once right now, but after the show, if you want to hang around, we'll bring it out on stage, we'll do it again, okay? <clears throat> Galileo, other contributions, he talked about objects falling. And the old idea was that you have a heavy object, you have a light object, you let go of them, which one hits the ground first? The heavy one. That was the old idea. Galileo came along and said if you drop two objects in a vacuum, doesn't matter what their masses are, they should hit the ground at the same time. 
So, let's see. I've got a couple of objects here. I've got a heavy object, a piece of wood. I've got a light object, a piece of paper. And I'm going to drop them. We know what's going to happen, don't we? Which one's going to hit the ground first? The wood. Let's see. Are you ready? The wood. So what Galileo said was if we drop them in the absence of air, if air wasn't interfering, then they would fall at the same rate. But you know what? These objects are about the same size. So they're hitting the air molecules. And that means that because they're the same size as they fall, they both experience the same force from the air. But like the empty wagon experiences in the force, the light object has a big change in motion because of that. But the heavy object, its motion doesn't change very much because of that force. So I need to change, I need to reduce the force on the piece of paper. If I could magically keep the weight, keep the mass of the paper the same, but change the way it interacts with the air so it's not as much, by maybe making it smaller. Now I have a light object, a piece of paper, a heavy object, a piece of wood, and we'll drop them and see which one hits the ground first. Are you ready? Three, two, one. So I think that was pretty close, right? Pretty much the same time. Light object, heavy object, hit the ground at the same time. Uh, so we've already dropped them side by side. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take the piece of paper and put it underneath the wood. 